Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it written in our heart and mind this night. We will take hold of it, be doers of it. We thank you for all that you bring forth this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We began this morning sharing with you on the subject of understanding the three types of spiritual tests that God, that's recorded in the Word of God that we must know about. We talked about the fact that there are three different ones. There is where God tests man to find out whether he's going to walk in the ways of the Lord. There's also one where man tests God by not doing what God says provoking him, and which would bring judgments upon man. And then there's also where Satan tests man with the purpose of taking out the word and to steal, kill, and destroy in some aspect and to bring a destructive work in man's life. We begin here in Isaiah 28, verse 16. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone. That's speaking of Jesus. He was the stone, and they understood about what the stone was when he's speaking this, because the stones are what, how you built the temple. The temple had all these stones, and Jesus, there was the cornerstone of the temple. And he says that he's now going to bring a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone. This is a new temple that is coming forth, and Jesus is the cornerstone of it, the spiritual temple, the spiritual house of God, the sure foundation. And notice, Jesus is the tried stone. This means he was tested. He was tested by God, and he had to obey him, and we talked about that. He also had to pass the tests and overcome all of the devil's attacks. And remember, he was tempted in all, all points, yet without sin, as we talked about. One scripture we want to bring up from this morning that we did talk about, we talked about a lot of things, but Psalms 105 is certainly a scripture you need to be aware of. Many people think that, well, it's just going to be, God's just going to test me for a moment and that'll be it. Not so. Psalms 105 and verse 19 is speaking about Joseph in the context. Until the time that his word came, talking about the coming of the word coming to pass, all the things that were spoken about him, the word of the Lord tried him. Otherwise, he was being tried consistently throughout his life. That's a revelation to you that God is trying you throughout your life with the Word of God to see whether you will walk in line with His Word or not. Joseph was tested continually. He passed the test. You and I are going to be tested and tried throughout our life to see whether we're going to walk in line with the Word of God. And of course, God wants to bring blessings. We talked about how he, we're tested in our heart also in our soul, also in our mouth. These are important areas as he, it comes to examine us and to put us to the test and see whether we're walking right with him and also to bring us to the place of being refined and being purified before the Lord. We talked about how man tests God and covered those different areas. And then we began to talk about how Satan tests man with the purpose to bring destruction. He tests them with evil. And we talked about many things about the purpose, which was primarily attacking the Word, to bring the Word out and get you to walk in sin, to bring some sort of destruction in your life in some aspect. One thing for sure, you must understand how the enemy works. You must not be ignorant of his devices. We saw this scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. In verse 11, and preceded by when he was telling them that they needed to forgive. Verse 10, to whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, and for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. They needed to forgive. They were slow to do it. And why is he saying that? Lest Satan should get an advantage of us if we don't forgive. For we are not ignorant of his devices. We must know that if we are having unforgiveness in our life, we've given place to him. That's one of his devices, to get you into sin, to get you not to walk in line with the word of God and do what the word says. You're going to give place to him, and he will have an advantage over you. We also saw in Ephesians chapter 6, when we put on the whole armor of God, 
which is the word in us, in our mind, in our heart, in our mouth, directing our steps, then we'll be able to stand successfully against the wiles of the devil. We put on clothing yourself with the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the tricks, the strategies. The devil has all kinds of tricks and strategies. The evil spirits have been around all along throughout your life, and they've come into you from inheritance, your own sins and victimization. They know you like a book. They know how your all weak places are, your weak spots. They know how to push your buttons. They know how to work against you. You must realize they're going to work all kinds of wiles and tricks and strategies to try to get to you. We talked about the fact that they'll work many different ways, and we covered many things that we talked about. This morning, we're not going to, of course, go back over. We talked extensively about this. But we're going to continue on this subject and talk about why some failed the spiritual tests. Because they gave place to the enemy, and they didn't do the things that God wanted them to do. <clears throat> we begin with Adam. <clears throat> Adam failed. He failed the test. What did God say regarding Adam at the, very, the beginning here? He commanded the man, saying in Genesis 2.16, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. He gave him a command. Did he obey it? No, he didn't. We see this in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, where the woman who took of the fruit and ate, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now you say, well, the woman was deceived. Yeah, that's right. The woman was deceived, but was the man deceived? No. The revelation was given to Paul. And he wrote this here in this letter to Timothy, 1 Timothy 2.14. Adam was not deceived. The woman being deceived was in the transgression, but Adam knew exactly what he was doing. He willfully disobeyed God and did the wrong thing. We also see that he not only disobeyed what God told him to do, but he also didn't resist what the wife had told him to do. Because Genesis 3.17, it says, Unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, you did what she wanted you to do, what you told her to do. And has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake, and sorrow you shall eat of it all the days of thy life. Adam should have never obeyed what his wife told him. Why? Because his wife told him something contrary to the word of God. It doesn't matter who tells you anything. It should never obey anything contrary to the word of God. But, you know, a, a man and a wife are close together. And you have to make sure that you do not compromise for a husband and or a wife. If you do, you're going to pay the price. And that's what happened. Made a mistake. You never disobey God's word. You always do what the word says, and you must do it. Adam did not. He failed the spiritual test. And of course, Eve, she also failed the test because she got deceived. She didn't know the word. We pointed this out this morning, the fact that when the serpent came and said, you shall not eat of the tr every tree of the garden, and the woman made the statement here saying, you can eat of the fruit of the, fruit of the trees of the garden, but then in verse 3, But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. God never said anything about not touching it. And also the tree in the midst of the garden, as we saw, was the tree of life, not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Therefore, she didn't have the word straight. If you don't have the word straight, you can be deceived very easily. You know, we are to know the precise, correct, accurate knowledge of the word of God. And if we don't know it exactly, the devil can deceive you very easily. She got deceived, of course, and then he threw another one at her, of course, saying, you'll not surely die, and then saying, you're going to be as gods. And so she, fo focusing on all these things, got into the senses, got into, and, and made this tremendous mistake of taking it herself, as well as giving to her husband with her, and he did eat. So they failed, and then what do we have? We have the problem that we have as Satan became the one who was the ruler of this world as he, he gave the authority 
that was entrusted unto him into the hands of Satan. And so that's why we've seen all this destruction, of course, in the world. We see also in Genesis chapter 4, another one who did not pass the test, he failed, was Cain. God had, through Eve now, had bore two children, Cain and Abel. Abel was a keeper of the sheep, Cain was a tiller of the ground. In verse 3, in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Well, that sounds like a good, a good thing. Abel, he also brought of the firstlings. This is the right, birthright offering, which was the first fruits, the firstlings. That's the tithe of his flock. And the fat, which was the choicest part thereof. God had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Well, why was that? Because obviously he obeyed what he told him to do and bring the first fruit to him. Cain and his offering he did not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Obviously, if Abel was told to bring the firstlings of the flock, the tithe, the fat, the choicest part, Cain would have been told the very same thing. But what did he do? He brought of the fruit of the ground an offering. He decided what he wanted to do. He did not pass the test. That tells you an important thing. The devil will try to get you just to do whatever you want to do instead of doing what God says. If you do not obey what God tells you to do and you just do it your way, your offering will not be received. You will not pass the spiritual test. Here we see he was not a tither. He did it whatever he wanted to. That was a great mistake. You cannot walk in your own way or do your own thing. You must do what God says. Otherwise, you're not going to be approved. You're not going to be passing the spiritual test. And of course, in this case, his offering wasn't received. And then the result was he got mad about it. And then, of course, he ended up murdering his brother. And then, of course, compounded more problems. And now he's cursed in the earth. You fail the test. And where did it all start? He didn't obey what God told him to do. You must obey the word of God, and everybody is to be a tither. It began at the beginning. It continued with Abraham. It continued with Isaac. It continued through the time of the Old Testament, and it continues today because here men that die receive tithes, but there of whom it witnessed that he liveth receiveth them, which is Jesus in heaven. So that tells you something. If you're not a tither, you're failing the spiritual test. In fact, we know what it says over in Malachi. In Malachi, he got after these guys because they had failed. And he told them, here in chapter 3 of Malachi, in verse 8, he said, Will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? He said, In tithes and offerings, because it belongs to him. The first fruits belongs to God throughout the word of God. It belongs to him. Therefore, you must bring the first fruits unto him. They were robbing God, and of course, the result was that they were cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. We don't want to make that mistake. Make sure that you are always bringing the tithe unto the Lord. We see another case where someone failed the spiritual test. Abram was one who passed a lot of tests, but there's at one point in time where because he didn't have a child yet, even though God had told him that he was going to be having an heir, well, Sarah here, it says in Genesis 16, 1, Sarah, Abram's wife, bare him no children. She had a handmaid, an Egyptian, whose name was Hagar. So Sarah said to Abram, Behold now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go into my may. It may be that I may obtain children by her. Now, was that what God had said? No. Did Abram follow what God had said? No. He hearkened to the voice of Sarah again. That means you cannot be doing things that are contrary to the word. If your wife ever tells you to do something contrary to the word, you just say no. Or likewise, if the husband, wife, uh, husband tells a wife to do something, you say no as well. If it's not in line with the word of God, you can't make that mistake. He made a big mistake. What was the result? And we got Ishmael, the ones that are all the ones that we have, you know, and there are the ones now, are the, the roots of the Muslims and all these ones today, that we have this tremendous problem. 
What a mistake. He made a mistake and failed the spiritual test. We see over in Genesis chapter 19, speaking of Lot. Lot had been rescued, remember, in Genesis 14 by Abram after he'd been taken captive. And you'd think he would have got on board with the things of the Word of God. But he didn't. He ended up living in a place in Sodom. <laughs> it was a terrible place. A place where all these men, were, there was fornication, was rampant. Homosexuality was rampant in the place. There was no, there was just total uh, immorality going on continually. And here we have the time when there was going to be a judgment that was going to come. The judgment was set. And here, after when these ones came, the men, these ones came and, and uh, the, the angels had come, and he brought them into the house. He told them that the place was going to be destroyed. And we pick up here in verse uh, 19, cha chapter, four, chapter 19, verse 4, Before they laid down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round both old and young people, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. That means they wanted to have sexual relations with them. Homosexuality was rampant. And here, you know, he should have, first of all, not even given place to this. He went to the door, uh, unto them, out to the door, and shut the door after them. And he says, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. At least he knew it was wicked. But then look what he says. Well, I got two, water, two daughters that have not known man. Here, you can have them. Since when would you give your daughters to those who would commit fornication with them? It shows you he did not have the word of God in him. He was in a wicked place and it got a hold of him. You have, must take a stand and you cannot let the wickedness of wherever you are get a hold of you. It obviously got a hold of him. And of course, the judgment came. Meaning he didn't get things straight in his life and he obviously didn't teach it to the rest of them. Because then when they were told to get out of the city, of course, we came to the time when they left, the other one who didn't pass the test, this is Lot's wife. He was told to leave and not look back, the angel said. Verse 26, his wife looked back from behind and she became a pillar of salt. What was the problem with looking back? She was looking back. This really refers to showing regard to something, the fact that she was longing for this, this where she'd left from. Uh, it's, she made a great mistake. This actually means to look intently in the Hebrew regarding with pleasure, favor, care, and yearning for it. She had an ungodly soul tie with that place. You can't have ungodly soul ties with anything that's wicked. It'll keep holding you captive in that area. You need to break that and get that broken off of your life. Otherwise, you'll keep being drawn back to that same destructive thing. She didn't want to leave. And so, of course, she became a pillar of salt. And then we come to Lot's daughters. You know, he obviously, he'd not been teaching them the word of God the way they should. These guys all failed. And so here, he go, Lot goes up to Zor. In verse 30, the two daughters went with him. And so here, the firstborn says in verse 31, because what's their mentality? Oh, sexual sin, anytime, anywhere, anybody, doesn't matter what it is. The firstborn said to the younger, Our father's old, there's not a man in the earth to come in unto us. Well, sure there were, all, they were all over the place. After the manner of all the earth, they just, that was their attitude. And so they said, Come, let us make our father drink wine. We'll lie with him that we may preserve seed of our father. Incest. Obviously, sexual sin was just no big deal in Sodom. And they had that kind of a mentality. And the daughters then, of course, both of them, lied, let, let, were laying with him, fornication, and that illegitimate curse came because they both conceived. And of course, that's given rise to the illegitimate curse. If you are conceived out of wedlock, then there's an illegitimate curse. We see this in Deuteronomy 23 too. The bastard, which is the illegitimate child, shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. It's a ten-generation ten curse that came because of this. Ammonite or Moabite, they were the children from the, the daughters. 
shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to their tenth generation, they shall not enter in the congregation of the Lord. This is the ones that were the product of the ancestral relationship. They failed. They had a sin consciousness. They did not deal with sin. They were, their minds were renewed to the way that everybody was. And that's what you have to guard yourself against. You cannot let the lawlessness and the ungodliness that gets in this world, which is going to get worse and worse as we go, you can't let it get a hold of you. If it gets a hold of you, you could be falling into these same kind of things. Because the lawlessness abounds, the Bible says, that the love of many will wax cold. That's, that's talking about the church, people that are born again. We can't have that. We've got to make sure we're walking the right way. The answer is you've got to get the Word in you. You've got to teach the Word to your family. You've got to command them after the ways of the Lord. Absolutely essential. This is what we must do. You've got to put the Word of God first place. Abram, one of the things he did that was right. Genesis 18, 19. God speaking about Abraham. He says, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him. You command your children and your household after the word of God. And they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice. This means righteousness and judgment or what is just and right in God's sight. That the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Notice, it's tied into seeing the Lord bless you if you command your children and your household after the way of the Lord. That is absolutely mandatory. In fact, we even see, we'll jump over to another one, one who did not do what he was supposed to do. He didn't restrain his people his, in his family from, from doing what evil things that they were doing. We come over to the first Samuel chapter 2. Eli, who was a priest, failed. He failed because he didn't do what God told him to do. 1 Samuel 2.22, Eli was very old, heard all that his sons did unto Israel, how they lay with women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. He knew they were committing fornication. He didn't do anything about it. He said, why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, there's no good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people to transgress. Well, fine, but he didn't do something about it and restrain them from that and stop them from doing this, unfortunately. We come down to verse 27. Came a man of God unto Eli and said, Thus saith the Lord, did I plainly appear into the house of thy father when you were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, upon, to offer upon my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me, to be a priest? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? So all your needs would be met. He says, Wherefore kick you at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and you honor my sons above me. Hmm. You cannot honor your daughters, your sons, your wife, your husband, anybody, Contrary to the word of God, or you're in trouble. To make yourselves fat with the cheapest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. He liked the money coming in. And so he was going to compromise and let the sons keep on doing the things that they did. He did not restrain them. What a mistake. Wherefore the Lord God of Israel said, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now... The Lord saith, Be it far from me, for them that honor me I will honor. But they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Why would he be despising him? Because he didn't do what the word said. He did not obey the word. If you don't do the word, you despise him. Whether you realize whether you think that in your mind or not. That's the way God says things are. Behold, the days come that I'll cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, and there shall not be an old man in thine house. The whole group was going to die out, and they're going to die out early. What a judgment was pronounced over them. What a big mistake, because they didn't do what was right. You'll see an enemy in my habitation, all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. And the man of thine whom I shall not cut off from thine altar shall be to consume thine eyes, to grieve thine heart, and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. He got to the place where his eyes were all dim because it was a curse upon him. And everything was dying out. He lost everything. 
What a big mistake, because he wouldn't do it. He said, this will be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons on Hophni and Phinehas, and one day they're both going to die. And that's exactly what happened. Big price to pay. Then when Samuel comes along, and he says in verse 11 in chapter 3, the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I'll do a thing in Israel at bo bo which both the ears of every one that heareth shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all things that I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I will also make an end. God doesn't say something and then not bring it to pass. So, of course, the judgments came. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth. You know, you know something, you've got to deal with it. You can't let it slide. Because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. That was the problem. He didn't restrain them. And of course, the end result was they died, and also he fell back and died as well. The judgment came upon him. He failed, and it cost him, because he did not do the things that God wanted him to do. We cannot fail by being disobedient to God and not carrying out what he says. If you're disobedient in any aspect of the Word of God, you're failing God. You're actually tempting God, as we saw today, and you are going to bring curses on you, and there's going to be many problems that are going to result. Moses had done tremendous things and passed the test continually, but he made a big mistake. God had told him to take the rod, gather the assembly together in Numbers 20, verse 8, Thou and Aaron thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock. The first time he smote it. Now he says, speak unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water. Well, you just do whatever God said. Speak to it, and it's going to give forth water. He understood whatever God said, if you did it, it happened. Now shall bring forth to them water out of the rock, and give the congregation their beast drink. Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him, and so they gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said to them, and you can tell by the words that are spoken, he wasn't thinking about what God was telling him to do. He had an attitude against them. He was reacting because of the way they were. Hear now, you rebels. Must we fetch you water out of this rock? Because they were rebellious. He was reacting the way they were, instead of just doing what God wanted him to do. We can't be reacting because of people what they do wrong. We just got to do what God says and do what is right in His sight. Because He was reacting in the flesh and got all bent out of shape and attitude, call them you rebels of the congregation. Well, Moses lifted up his hand with the rod. He smote the rock twice. Instead of doing what God said, he did what he was reacting because he was, he was in the flesh on things. The water came out, but at the same time, the result was he was in trouble. Lord spake to Moses and Aaron, Because you believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring the congregation to the land that I have given to them. Quite a price to pay. He definitely failed the test. In Numbers, we go back to verse 13. They'd sent out the spies to spy out the land. They came back and brought the fruit of the land, and return from searching out the land after 40 days, Numbers 13, verse 25. Here it says, they came to Moses, they showed him all the fruit of the land. Verse 27. They told him and said, We came into the land where thou seest, and surely it flows with milk and honey. This is the fruit of it. So the land that God told them, and this is what you're going to find, they found it, they brought it back. Nevertheless, now whenever you hear a nevertheless, you know something else is going to be coming out. It's like, I know the word says such and such, but. Yeah, here's the fruit, but nevertheless. Now, were they going to do what God wanted to do? No, now they were going to make a reason why they couldn't go in and possess the land. The people be strong that dwell in the land. The cities are walled and very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak, the giants there. So, what's that got to do with obedience to God and going in to possess what God told you to go get? and possess the land. The Malachites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites dwell in the mountains, Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. The enemies are everywhere. 
That's right. Well, Caleb, he stilled the people. He said, be quiet. He hushed them before Moses and said, let us go up at once and possess it, for we're well able to overcome it. God told us to go do it. Anything God says, we're well able to overcome it. And we should be obeying God and going in to possess this land. Well, those ten, the ten, which was the majority, unfortunately, they said, the men that went up with them said, we be not able to go against the people. They're stronger than we. Who are they looking to to fight their battles? Stronger than we? Well, God's the one that fights the battles. Since when are we looking at me, thinking? No. They got their eyes off of the Lord. And when you get your eyes off the Lord, you will be deceived. And you'll start thinking about what you can do yourself, and you're going to fail. That's exactly what they did. In fact, they got deceived. These guys are stronger than we. What a mistake. Brought up an evil report of the land. Remember, this is the land that was full of milk and honey and all the fruit and everything. And they said, the land through which we've gone to search it, it's a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. Boy, they really changed their tune real quick, didn't they? From milk and honey to one that's going to eat up everybody. And all the people we saw in it are men of a great stature. We saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. Now you can tell. Do they have the eyes on the Lord? No. They had their eyes on themselves. They thought these guys were stronger than us. And then they get deceived and they're changing their tune on what the land was. And now it even affects them in their own sight. <coughs> he says, we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. We're grasshoppers. We can't do anything about it. God was the one who was fighting their battles and giving them victories. And so we were in their sight. They got deceived. All because they got this, all the things they saw. They started being moved by what they saw. If you get into the natural and you're looking at things that you see, you're going to be deceived real quick. You're to get your eyes on God in the realm of the Spirit. Believe the Word. And know that God is the one who fights the battles, and the greater one is in you than he that's in the world. Therefore, how could they see themselves as grasshoppers and think the enemy thinks they're a grasshopper? God would fight their battles. Don't you ever get a grasshopper image and think that anything is stronger than you? The greater one lives in you. Well, you're going to put them in operation as you do what the Word says, and God is going to smite your enemies and fight the battle. The battle's the Lord's, and the victory is ours. Yes, amen. That's what they should have been doing. And what a big mistake. The congregation, the voice cried, the people wept that night. And of course, here, of course, then they were murmuring against them and said, wish we had died in the land of Egypt and all this kind of stuff. Of course, what happened? They didn't get into the land because of the four. And God then said, because you won't go into this land for every day, the 40 days that you searched out, you're going to spend a year for every day in the wilderness. 40 years in the wilderness until they got consumed. They made a great mistake. They didn't think they could conquer the enemy. Don't you ever make that mistake. Don't think you can't conquer the enemy. You're believing a lie. You're well able to conquer every enemy because of who is in you and because his word has declared you're to do it. Do not believe the enemies are stronger than Christ in you, the greater ones in you. Do not be moved by what you see in the natural. And do, don't be looking at yourself and think that you are a grasshopper compared to the devils or any enemies arrayed against you. And as they even believe, oh, they think we're a grasshopper too. That's not so. The devil knows who's on the inside of you. And that's why he resorts to all the different means to deceive you because he knows that if you really realize who you are and who's on the inside of you, he, you know, those devils know that they're going to get defeated for sure. So you've got to make sure that you don't give place to the lies of the devil. And do not ever let you have a, yourself have an image contrary to the Word of God. Who else failed? Because we've got to correct all these problems. You don't want to fall after the same things that what's happened to the others. Joshua chapter 7. We see in verse 10. This is after they got defeated in a battle. Now why would they get defeated in the battle when God had already given them victory in all the other battles? Something must be wrong. 
Here it is. Verse 11. Israel has sinned. They've transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, for they've even taken the cursed thing and have stolen, dissembled also, and they've even put it among their own stuff. If you sin, you've transgressed the covenant. Is God going to be able to perform His covenant promises for you? No. You can't have sin in the camp and think you can win a battle. There's no way. He said, therefore, the children of Israel couldn't stand before their enemies. There's no way you're going to be able to stand and get the victory over them whatsoever because they were accursed. If you have sin in the camp, you're under a curse. That's why you've got to confess your sin and turn from it and get right with the Lord. Of course, what was the answer for these guys? Up sanctify the people. You've you got to get sanctified. You're going to have to confess the sin. You're going to have to get this dealt with and correct it in your life and get yourself right with the Lord so that then you, and you've got to get the cursed thing, of course, out of you or anything that you might have, get rid of it, so you're not giving place to the enemy. I mean, you can't just, well, I got rid of some of the sins, but I got these other areas of sins that I'm just not willing to get rid of because I like doing them or I want this or that. You're in trouble. If you won't get all your sins out, Forget about winning any battles. It's not going to happen. A little bit of less sin, sin is like leaven. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Little foxes, well, that'll destroy the whole vine, spoil the vine. We must deal with the sin in our life. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to win your battle. And it's not just deal with some of them. We need to deal with all of them. Joshua chapter 9. Here's where God had told them to go in and drive out all the enemies, get rid of them all, every place they went. And so, every city, that's what they were to do. Now the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and Ai, and they were coming to do the same thing, and they were supposed to drive them all out and destroy them and eliminate them all. Of course, they worked wildly. They deceived them, making it like they were ambassadors and that they'd come from a far away place with all the, their shoes and their, clothes, their, their feet, their old garments, and bread, the provision was dry and moldy, so they tried to deceive these guys. And they said, we become from a far country, now therefore make a league with us, so that they wouldn't wipe them out and eliminate them. But did they do? They made a big mistake. As we see, we come down to verse 13. These bottles of wine which we filled were new, and behold, they be rent, and these our garments and shoes are become old by reason of this very long journey, they said. The men took of the vigils and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord to find out, well, is this right? Is this what we should do for these guys? They were all liars. They hadn't take, come from a far country whatsoever. Furthermore, God told them to drive all of the enemies out. So what did they do? They didn't get the counsel of God. They just decided to do it on themselves, on themselves, and they compromised the word of God of what he told them to do. He's, they were supposed to drive all the enemies out. None of them were supposed to stay. And so, of course, in doing so, they had to have the Gibeonites stay there, and they couldn't kill them off. And what a mistake they had, continually having these enemies in their land. Bad mistake. God does not want you to compromise anything. He doesn't, you ought to, got to take a stand. He doesn't want you to get the counsel that's contrary to the Word of God. You need to seek the Lord and make sure you're doing things in line with the Word, not ignore what He says. And if there's some question, you get the counsel of God and seek Him, and, and you seek Him until He reveals what He wants you to do. So, they failed, and they made a big mistake. We see another case over in Judges. This is dealing with Samson. We come down to chapter 16. And this is dealing with Delilah. Judges chapter 16, verse 16, she tried to get to him to tell what the source of the strength was. Remember, he was a Nazarite. And because of that, he was submitted unto the Lord, committed to do what he wanted. That was where his strength was because of the Nazarite vow that he had before the Lord. Verse 16, it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him, or really vexed him. His soul was vexed unto death. Well, that's a type of the devil coming and pressing you with either words or thoughts or keep harassing you time after time after time to try to wear you down. And that's exactly what happened. 
He finally told her all his heart, said to her, There's not come a razor upon my head. I've been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go for me, and I'll become weak and be like any other man. What a mistake. But how did he get to this place? She was pressing him daily with her words. You don't let anybody press you with their words that are contrary to what is right. Whether it's the devil working at you through thoughts or through whatever the situation, or another person used of the devil keep on harassing you or pressing you or trying to get you to do things contrary to the word of God. No. And don't let your soul get vexed by what they're doing. You should be speaking the word against it and stop that and not give place to it and not allow that to continue to go on. Unfortunately, he let it get to him finally. So you can't let the enemy daily press you, whether it's coming directly from the devil or coming through another individual used of the devil. He's trying to wear you down. Jesus didn't sit there and not deal with this. He spoke the word of God, extinguished the enemy. He would, we're told to resist the devil and he'll flee from you, not put up with them. Not sit there and let this continue to come against you until you finally give in and wear you down. That's what the devil will try to do. He failed. What a mistake. Of course, it cost him. He got wiped out. He lost his sight. You remember? That means that if you let yourself get, do things that God doesn't want you to do, you'll lose your spiritual sight. You won't be able to see right. And he ended up getting in bondage, of course. And so what a big mistake he made. We see another place in 1 Samuel chapter 15. This is talking about Saul. Saul also made a big mistake. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 17. Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, once you made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a journey. What did he tell him to do? We need to learn to do what God says. Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them till they be consumed. That would be a type of you going after and getting rid of all sin out of your life and smiting all the devils and casting them all out till they're all gone. That's what you do. Utterly destroy them. Wherefore then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but did fly upon the spoil and did evil in the sight of the Lord? Instead of eliminating everything and destroying them all, they didn't. And Saul says to Samuel, Yea, I've obeyed the voice of the Lord. I've gone the way which the Lord sent me, and I brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and utterly destroyed the Malachites. Well, he wasn't supposed to, he's supposed to destroy them all. So he didn't do everything that God told him to do. And then now he says, the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. So he's shifting the blame. Who's the one that's the head and may, may, should have been making the decisions? The king. But he wants to, you know, shift the blame to these others. The people got to me and the people, that's their fault. Don't be a blame shifter. Whatever God has told you to do, don't try to shift blame. Remember, Adam shifted the blame to his wife, even though it was true. But nonetheless, he was a blame shifter. We can't be shifting the blame. We need to take the deal with things ourselves. And of course, God, Samuel said, Is the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? No. As in obeying the voice of the Lord? No. He wants you to obey and get rid of them. To obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. He's not interested in all those other things. He wants you to obey. He was rebellious, wasn't he? Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Now, what, is that? Why, what is that all about? It doesn't say it is the sin of witchcraft. It's as the sin of witchcraft. Why? Witchcraft is control. People use witchcraft to control people. Otherwise, when you're in rebellion, you're trying to be in control. You want to be in control. You want what you want. You cannot be in rebellion. Otherwise, that shows a controlling, dominating spirit. People that are Jezebelic type people have a lot of rebellion and stubbornness in them. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Why? Because you're doing what you want instead of what God wants. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. That tells you something. If we're rebellious, if we're stubborn, if we're disobedient, in essence, we've rejected the word of the Lord. And notice, what's the, what's, what's the, what's the result of it? 
You're rejected from being king. How would that apply to us? If you're rebellious and stubborn and aren't obedient to what God tells you to do, you're not going to be ruling and reigning as a king. Even though you're in a position to one, you're going to be rejected as a king as well. No. we got to follow what God says and do the things that he tells us to do. Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned. He finally admitted he sinned. For I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. You can't be afraid of another person and obey their voice if they're wrong. Whether it's one person or people or whoever it might be, don't be afraid to speak what is right. You cannot allow that to happen. So, you want him to pardon a sin? And of course, no, nope, the Lord's rejected thee from being king. He got rejected because he made the bad mistake. And of course, then, he really got off track and he ended up going and even seeking after uh, information from a witch. What a mistake. Shows you can really go downhill. Look at what it says about why Saul died. First Chronicles 10, 13. Saul died for his transgression, which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord. See, it's against the word of God. If you don't do the word of God, you're transgressing against him. You're committing a transgression, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. Well, that was a mistake. It cost him. He inquired not of the Lord, therefore he slew him and turned the kingdom into David, the son of Jesse. He died and he lost the kingdom. What will happen? Death will come upon you in some aspect. Curses will come surely and you will not rule and reign over your enemies whatsoever. We see another problem people that didn't pass the test, and it was all the people. Back in 1 Samuel chapter 8, when Samuel was old, and the people came to him in verse 5 and said, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in the, thy ways. Make, now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. Well, the prophet was the one judging him and giving the word of the Lord and telling him what to do. And we don't want to hear from a prophet anymore. Give us a king and let us be like all the nations. We're not supposed to be like the nations. You and I are to be a part of a holy nation and we're to walk in submission unto the Lord. We don't want to be submitted unto the ungodly nations. Here he says, we want to be like the nations. The thing displeased Samuel and he said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel, Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, hearken to the voice of the people and all they say. They've reje not rejected thee, but they've rejected me that I should not reign over them. You must let the word of God rule and reign in your life. If you do not let it rule and reign in your life, you have rejected his rulership, his lordship over you. Remember what he said in the New Testament. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things I say? You know, people say they're a Christian, and they hear the word, and they don't do it. They haven't made him Lord over their life whatsoever. They've rejected his reign. If you are not doing the word of God in an aspect of your life, you've rejected the reign of God over you. Well, you can't allow that to happen. These guys made a big mistake. And so they said they forsake me, and that's what they were doing. And you said, you know, hearken to their voice. That shows you something. God will let you choose the things you want, even though it's not what he wants for you. He didn't want them to be doing this but he'll let you have your way because he set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. He sets before you a choice as we see back in Deuteronomy chapter 30. See, God will not usurp authority over your will. He's told you what to do. He's given you a free will. He tells you what to do. He expects you to make the right choice. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. One's good, one's bad. Therefore, choose life. Of course, he tells you which one to choose. That both thou and thy seed may live. It's going to affect your seed as well. So, we need to choose the things that God wants us to choose. Well, these guys didn't want to do that. They refused. They were, even though God told them, tell them all the things are going to happen. And he told them all the things are going to happen. How they were going to be in bondage. 
and they were going to take all their money and they were going to take their children and, and make them for slaves essentially from them. And, but did they, did they care about that? No. Comes down after he had protested to them and told them all the things that would happen to him. He said, you're going to cry out in the day because of the king you've chosen you. And the Lord's not going to hear you in that day. You're going to say, oh, this king has done all these terrible things to us. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, nay, but we'll have a king over us. What a mistake. We cannot allow ourselves to not be submitted unto the Lord. Not only did they not want his rule and reign over their life, they didn't want to do what he told them to do which was engaged in the warfare. That we also may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. You are to fight the battle. You are to fight the good fight of faith. You are to war a good warfare. You are to be a soldier in the army of the Lord, and you are to engage in the warfare. If you won't submit to God and you won't engage in the warfare, you're just like these guys. If you don't obey the word, it's just like you're just like them. We need to engage in the warfare. We need to be submissive and to do the things that God said. Sammy heard the words of the people, rehearsed them in the ears of the people. And God said, hearken to their voice, make them a king. And of course, that was a great mistake. And they saw all kinds of destructive things that happened because they disobeyed the Lord. Second Samuel he got taken out of the hip to Saul's hands, remember, and given over to David, and he was doing fine, but uh, he made a mistake as well, and it cost him throughout his life. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle. What was David supposed to be doing? Going forth to the battle. You and I are kings. What are we supposed to be doing? Going forth to the battle. You're to be war in a good warfare, fighting the good fight, conquering your enemies, working out your own salvation, engaging in warfare intercession, deliverance, conquering all the enemies. So David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. He wasn't doing what God wanted. Now, if you're not obeying God, what's that mean? Now you're in sin land. You're sinning. You're transgressing what he told you to do. So, now he's in trouble. It came to pass the eventide. David arose from off his bed, walked on the roof of the house, king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. The woman was very beautiful to look upon. And he sent and inquired after the woman, and one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam? He's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. He's somebody else's wife. <laughs> Sent messengers, took her and came in unto her and lay with her. And she was purified from her uncleanness and he returned into her house. And of course, she ended up getting pregnant. Here, because he wasn't doing the right thing, he was now on the devil's territory. And the devil can deceive you and take you down a wrong path. Remember those guys were worshiping God and then when they turned away from him, now they're worshiping four-footed beasts and all these things. You say, What's, these guys must have lost their mind. Well, here he is. He's the king. He knows this is wrong. And yet, you get deceived when you get in sin. Sin deceives you. The deceitfulness of sin, it'll cause a hardening of your heart. It'll affect you adversely. You depart from the living God, as it says in Hebrews chapter 3, which means now you're on the devil's territory, and the evil spirits will come into you, and they will work against you. And that's exactly what happened here. Here he commits adultery. And so then he takes this person's wife, and then, of course, he tried to cover it up, which is a mistake. And then he sends him out to the hottest part of the battle, Uriah, and gets him essentially murdered. So he's guilty of adultery and murder, as well as disobedience and rebellion unto God. What a mistake. It cost him. Because from that, because of that, the, the, the sword never departed from his house. He had a curse coming upon him continually because of the things that he did. Of course, the child also died, remember. Well, what a big mistake. It cost him. You and I must be doing what God says. If you're not doing what God says and entering into the fight, obeying him, you're set up for a fall. You're on the devil's territory. You think that you're going to be okay. You're deceived. And he will, his deception will work you and lead you down a wrong path. And that's exactly what happened to him, and it cost him. 
we see another case. And this is Solomon. Solomon's the one who wrote all these Proverbs and wrote 1,005 songs. And all, he had this tremendous wisdom and God had blessed him with tremendous riches and wealth and he had tremendous wisdom. And God appeared to him two different times, as a matter of fact. You'd think this guy would be walking right all the days of his life. 1 Kings 9, 1. This is the time when they finished the building of the house of the Lord. And here's when the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time. And he said, I've heard thy prayer and supplication. He talked about how he did this, built the house and so forth. And then he makes some statements to him in verse 4. If thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked, that's consistency, integrity of heart, in integrity of heart and uprightness, to do according to all that I've commanded, not some, and will keep my statutes and my judgments. Then I will establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever. It'll, that rule will stay, as I promised to David thy father. That's what, it, what God wanted. There will not be a fail of a man upon the throne of Israel. But if you shall at all turn from following me, you or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes I set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel out of the land which I've given them, and this house which I've hallowed for thy name will I cast out of my sight. Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. That shows you something. If you don't follow God's word, then you're following something else. If you're not obeying him, then you must be having other gods, something else that you're obeying, whether it's you, whether it's money, whether it's, you know, whatever it might be. Oftentimes it's just you, I want to do what I want to do. Idolatry of self is a biggie that needs to be destroyed in your life, doing whatever you want to do. So, of course, what was the result? He, he said, pronounced what was going to happen. And so these guys, he, he heard the, the judgment that was going to come. Did he take heed to that? No. He had a problem as well. 1 Kings 11, verse 1. King Solomon loved many strange woman, women. They were only supposed to take wives of the Israelites in covenant relationship. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women, the Moabites, they're the enemies. The Ammonites, the Edenites, the Sidonians, the Hittites. What's he doing with them? What a mistake. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said to the children of Israel, you shall not go in unto them, neither shall they come in unto you. Because look what's going to happen if you give place to these things. Surely they will turn away your heart after other gods. You'd think I could never go after another god. You could. They said, you, he probably thought that would never happen to him, but look what happened to him. His wives turned away as their heart after other gods. And Solomon clave unto these in love. What a mistake. He had all these wives, and the wives turned away his heart. It came to pass when he was old, over time, the wives turned away his heart after other gods. His heart was not perfect where the Lord his God was the heart of David his father. And even went after these idols, Ashtoreth, the goddess of Zidonians, Milcom, the abomination of the, of the Ammonites. He did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord whatsoever. He built a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. What a mistake. He got deceived big time. You'd think that this guy would have never got deceived, but he committed apostasy, idolatry, total rebellion, marrying the people that he shouldn't have been marrying. He was warned of the apostasy and the idolatry. He was supposed to guard his heart, but instead he allowed his, these ungodly ones to come in and turned his heart away from the Lord. And here he ended up in the state that he was in. What a destructive thing. Verse 9 says, The Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which appeared to him twice. And he commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord had commanded. Well, you know he's going to be in trouble. Wherefore the Lord said to Solomon, For as much as he has done of this, thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servant. Again, when you disobey, the rule and the reign of God is going to be taken away from you, and you're not going to rule and reign over anything. In fact, the enemies are going to rule and reign over you. And you're going to see curses coming upon you and bringing destruction in your life. 
What a mistake. We may need to make sure that we always follow the Lord. Here's another case. Asa, he was one of the good kings, but he relied on the Lord at first, and God gave him all these victories against the Lubans and the, the, um, the Ethiopians and destroyed them. We come down to 2 Chronicles 16, and here was when the year of Asa's reign, there was no wars because he was doing the right thing. He didn't have any wars. So now, this one, uh, the reign of Asa, the king of uh, Basha, the king of Israel, came up against Judah. What should he have done? Relied on the Lord. What did he do? He got the money, the gold and silver, out of the treasure of the house, and he sent to the king of Syria to come and help him. He should have been looking to the Lord to win the battle. Now, he's going to this other guy. Well, that's a denial of the Lord. The Lord's the one who gave him the victory. And so he made a league between him, hearkened done to him. He came and, uh, you know, uh, attacked and, and stopped uh, this Basha from what the things that he was doing. And so he took all uh, Judah, carried away the stones, and looked like everything was going to be fine. No. You relied on someone else to win your battle. At the same time, Hanani the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord of thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. You may have shut down, thing, but the, this king got out of your hand. What a mistake. Were not the Ethiopians and Lubans a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. And he, of course, they smote them all. And then he says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. He didn't have any wars at that time. Everything was great. All of a sudden now, because he didn't rely on the Lord, he's going to have wars. You need to rely on the Lord. You need to do what his word says. You need to trust in the Lord. You need to obey what he says. You need to believe what his promises say and put him in operation to bring forth a victory for you in your life. Instead, because he turned away from relying on the Lord, who had already given him victory, tremendous victories over the, the Ethiopians, a million of them got killed, and the Lubims. Well, now he's got wars. What a mistake. We cannot make mistakes. Well, he should have repented on the spot, but then he made a worse mistake. And that's what happens, you know, when you give place to the devil, he comes in. Here, he didn't react the way he should have. He's wroth with a seer, put him in a prison house, in a rage with him because of this thing. Well, you think he's going to get away with that one? No way. This guy is going to be in trouble for sure. In the 39th year of his reign, he was diseased in his feet, till the disease was exceeding great. In his disease, he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. He continued to not even want to look to the Lord. His disease lasted two years, because he died after two more years in his 41st year. He made a great mistake. You need to make sure you're relying on the Lord. If you're not, then you're not going to see the victory. And if you don't repent of your sin, you could be like Asa, who ended up dying out, and he had this thing for two years. We must rely on the Lord, put him first place, and do all the things that he says in our life. Another one, of course, who failed was Lucifer. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? Why did he fall? Because he did not submit to God and do what God told him to do. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. Since when is he calling the shots? I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also among the mount of the congregation, the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Remember, you're to live unto yourself, not unto Him. 
You don't do what you want to do. Jesus didn't do anything that he wanted to do. He did everything that the Father told him to do. You and I are to put the word of God first place and do all that the word says. Furthermore, we see an idea of why all this was as well. I will be like the Most High. This means to in the resemble and be like him. This is the same word used over in Genesis when it talks about how man was made in the image, in the likeness, to form the same word, the likeness of him. What's that tell you, of, of God? What's that tell you? He was mad about the fact that man was created in the likeness of God and angels were on a lower order. I'm going to be like the Most High. I don't like it that somebody else is like the Most High in his likeness. He was jealous. They were jealous. That's why it wasn't just him. But remember, one third of the angels all followed after him and they all got wiped out. They're now in darkness because they rebelled against God. All because of jealousy, pride, and of course we see over in Ezekiel, it talks about what happened with him. Remember that God created him perfect in his ways. We see in verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. You walked up and down the midst of the stones of fire in the very presence of God. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. Unrighteousness is what this means, and was found in him. Why? It was perversity, this, this wrong, because of what he, he wasn't satisfied to be in the state he was in. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I'll cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I'll destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thy heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. He was a beautiful creature. Thou hast corrupted the, by wisdom, by reason of thy brightness. Thou, I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. Because of his pride, because of the jealousy, because of his disobedience here, because of his beauty, he thought he was a top dog. Pride got a hold of him. Pride will always bring you down. Do not let your heart get lifted up. And do not set your will to do the things that you want. You submit yourself unto God and do the things that he wants you to do and carry it out. We see another place. So we're looking at these so we don't make the same mistakes. Matthew chapter 14. We saw this this morning, but we're just going to bring it out again. Here we see Peter is walking on the water. Verse 30. This wind comes up from the devil. When he saw the wind, this violent, tempestuous wind, strong and mighty is what this word means, instead of rising up and commanding that thing to be quiet and peace be still, taking dominion, Jesus already taught them they're supposed to use their authority to conquer all the works of the enemy. He was afraid. He got afraid of what the devil was doing. And beginning to sink, of course, you begin to sink spiritually when you get in fear. Uh, he, of course, reached out to the Lord, said, Lord, save me, and he did. But then he says, immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand, caught him, and said to him, O oh, thou of little faith, your faith should have dealt with this. Anytime the enemy shows up, your faith should deal with the situation. Your faith should get an operation to conquer the enemy. The devil shows up. He should have put his faith in operation. No, nope. he says, Wherefore didst thou doubt? And it's revealing the word doubt is the word distazo. It means die means to, stazo means stand, two stands. When you're in two stands, you're in trouble. He's walking on the water, he's going to Jesus, but he also gets in fear reacting to what the enemy is doing. Many people, they got their eyes on Jesus and the promise, but they also get affected by the attacks of the enemy and they get in fear and they get in trouble. You can't be, you know, double-minded or two-souled, two stands. The double-minded man's unstable in all of his ways. Let not that man think he can take hold of anything of the Lord. It says James 1. We can't. We need to be single-minded. We should immediately deal with the devil and speak to that enemy and start conquering him. Put your faith in operation. Yeah. He made a great mistake. He's two-souled, double-minded. 
and he also let fear get a hold of him. We also see another place over here in Matthew 16. If someone tells you something from the Word of God, you should be responding properly to it. Jesus was telling them how he was, these guys, how he was going to go to Jerusalem, suffer many things, the elders, the priests, the scribes, be killed and be raised again the third day. He sort of said, oh, tell us more, give us revelation, we want to know about this or something. Was that the response? No. Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Since when are you going to rebuke the Lord when he tells you the word? Saying, be it far from thee, this Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Well, he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. He knew where it was coming from. Peter had given place to the devil. Anytime you are resisting the word of God, you're giving place to the devil. Any time that you're speaking things against what the Word would say or contrary to the Word of God, the devil's gotten a hold of you. The devil's now operating through you. He said, thou art an offense for me, thou savorest, or you're, you're not uh, um, minding, this is, means to mind the things that be of God, but those that be of men. That tells you. Why would a person not be responding positively to the Word? Because they're minding the things of men instead of what God said. Otherwise, I want what I want instead of what God wants. If we're thinking what God wants, we're going to respond to what God's Word says. If not, well, I want what I want. He, 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 didn't want the, he didn't like this. So he was minding the things of men. You cannot mind the things of men. You need to mind the things of God. Otherwise, you make a great mistake. Matthew chapter 18. So you don't pass the test. In Matthew chapter 18, this is the case where the man had been forgiven a great debt and then he had someone who owed him a small debt and he wouldn't forgive him. What we see, of course, is the great debt is all of our sins have been forgiven by the Lord. And then we have somebody else that's done something wrong to us, a small little debt thing that they've done to us. <coughs> what should we do? We should forgive them. We see that he would not forgive. Verse 31 of Matthew 18, when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told their Lord all that was done. This guy wouldn't forgive the small debt after he was forgiven a big debt. If we won't forgive someone for any of their sins after Jesus has forgiven us of all of our sins. His Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, O oh, thou wicked servant! God would call us, if we were in unforgiveness, a wicked servant. Anybody in unforgiveness is a wicked servant from God's standpoint. You've been forgiven. How can you not forgive somebody else? I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? The Lord was wroth, delivered unto the torment, and so should pay all that was due unto him. And he ties this to the forgiveness because he says, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, deliver you to the spiritual tormentors. If you from your hearts... It's got to be genuine, not going through the motions, not because I have to or I should. No, got to be from the heart. Forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Unforgiveness puts you in bondage. You will be in the tormentors. And who are those? Those are the evil spirits coming into you. And you can't have this attitude, well, I'll forgive them because I have to or I ought to. That's not meeting the conditions. You're still going to be in torment. The tormentors are coming in. You've got to forgive from your heart with a genuine forgiveness in line with the Word of God. Otherwise, you're going to be brought into captivity and bondage to the enemy. One other one that we'll bring forth. We've got to put the Word of God first place. In Mark chapter 7, he's speaking to them. He says, Well, have Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites? It is written, the people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Well, our doctrines better be in line with what God wants. Can we have things that are contrary to the word of God, commandments of men, traditions of men? No. For laying aside the commandment of God, they were holding the traditions of men. Anything that's contrary to the word of God is a tradition of men, it's contrary to what God says. 
He said, full well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. This is a major problem in the body of Christ. Well, I believe this way. And someone comes and shows you the fact that uh, this is contrary to the word of God. <laughs> well, are you ready to repent and change and turn away and say, you're right, I'm getting away from that? No. They didn't want to hear, the people don't want to hear that because they want to keep their own tradition. We believe it this way. I've heard that so many times over the years. This is what we believe. Well, if it's contrary to the word, there's a problem. Well, we believe that we don't have any demons in us anymore because that's what they said. We're born again, they're all gone. Yet Jesus said, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name, they shall cast out demons. Well, who's right? Is Jesus right or what you heard from so-and-so right? No, obviously that's all wrong and only the word of God is right. Otherwise, we've got to put the word of God first place. Otherwise, we've got traditions. We can't have traditions of men. The traditions of men make the word of God of none effect. Verse 13, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which you've delivered many such things like you do. Otherwise, you shut down the word from doing anything in your life because of traditions. That's why we got to do what the Word says. Just like pe people that won't get rid of their pagan holidays. Well, I mean to tell me you can show me the fact that Jesus wasn't born on December 25th? Well, that's right. He was born at the time of Tabernacles. It's a time, you remember, when they were all there? Why were they all there? For the Feast of Tabernacles. It was a time with no room in the inn. That's, you know, the time when the, the tax was, and it was right after the end of the harvest. Wasn't the other time December 25th? What's that all about? That's all about paganism and the worship of the sun god. Well, we still like to uh, hold fast to our uh, celebration. There have been hundreds of ministers that have held fast to this idolatrous thing instead of being willing to throw it out. Well, you're right. Obviously, he wasn't born then. What am I doing involved with this thing? People don't want to let go of it. Traditions seem to die very slow, even if they'll die at all. You have to be teachable. You have to be correctable. You have to be re receptive to truth. You've got to be ready to repent if you see the Word of God is the, brings forth something that's true, and it's contrary to what you understand. And this is why we've got to put the Word first place. We've always got to be teachable, and don't ever think, don't ever get this know-it-all spirit, think that I know it all, or whatever all, or I'm right, and all, everybody else has got to be wrong. You know, we've seen this with so many th situations, all kinds of things. The Bible says, pray to the Father. Well, I pray to Jesus. You know, we've seen that one. Well, we pray to Jesus. And so, you know, if you don't like it, get out. You know, <laughs> kind of attitude. Yeah, that's, that guy's in trouble. We can't be doing that. It says, pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. So why are we doing what Jesus said? Don't ask me anything. But then we see the traditions of men. You and I must put the Word of God first place in our life, in everything that we do. We've got to walk in the ways of the Lord. We can't compromise for anything. We're going to be judged according to all the things we do. We want to pass the spiritual tests. Of course, that's all about idolatry, the pagan sun god worship. You put a tree up in your any, anything. That is a symbol of the pagan sun god overcoming the true and living God. It's an abomination. It's idolatrous. And it's also essentially saying what that tree represents, if you understand it, is that the sun god defeated the true and living God and he's the real God. That's what you're acknowledging, if you understand about what it's all about. What? That's what it's all about. Read a book. Check it out. Read the book we have. Go to the library. You can find all these things out. Read the Two Babylons book by Hislop. He talks about all these kind of things. God wants us to come to the place of getting rid of everything that's not of the Lord. Be teachable. Be correctable. Put the Word of God first place. Because we've got to pass the spiritual tests. We can't be making, giving place to the devil and just doing things our way. That's why we've got to live unto him and put the word first place in our life in everything that we do. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you that I understand that I am being tested by the word of God all the days of my life in everything that I do. 
I am going to get the word in me. I'm going to put it first place in my life. And I'm going to pass all of God's spiritual tests by receiving his word, doing his word, and walking in line with it. And I will conquer all of Satan's tests to try to take the word out or to get me in sin or to get me not to rely on the Lord. I will rely on the Lord. I will fight the battle. I will have him rule over me. I will put the word first place. I will not transgress the word of God. I will keep all of his commandments. I will not rebel or disobey. I will not do what is contrary to the word. And I will conquer the enemies and I will pass God's tests and I will be approved of God. I thank you, Lord, that I'm putting the word first place and I will be obedient all the days of my life. Thank you for the great work you're doing in my life. I'm not going to give place to the devil and get off track, maybe get into idolatry or into any of this evilness. I thank you that if I walk in your ways, I will not be deceived and I will not get off into the things that I have no business being involved in. I will walk in righteousness, in line with the word of God, all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Remember, if you get off track, you may not intend to get off in some crazy things. You know, I don't think David intended that he was going to get off into those things or that Solomon was intending that he was going to get off into all these things and suddenly be building these, you know, Chemosh and Milcom, you know, abominations. But that's what happens. Or these guys that were worshiping God, and now all of a sudden they're worshiping forfeited beasts and all these things. What happens is you get deceived. And God gives you a reprobate mind if you don't walk right. And you won't think right. You're deceived. And you think, well, I can handle it myself. No, you won't. You'll get deceived and you'll make wrong choices. You'll do wrong things because you haven't put the word first place. And he gives people over to a reprobate mind. We can't allow that. You'll never have that if you put the word first place. But if you start to rebel and disobey the word, get ready for a reprobate mind, a mind not approved, and you'll end up going all, all kinds of directions, doing things that are going to bring curses upon you. Praise God for the word. That shows us the right way to walk. Put the word first place. God will bless you. He'll keep you away from the wars and all the destruction when you get these enemies out. Amen. You're going to see God bring forth his promises and his blessings. Remember, we're to have the showers of blessings coming upon us as we talked about in the past. Father, I thank you for all that you brought forth. We will be hearers and doers of the word. We will pass all tests before you and conquer every attack of the enemy and we will walk in victory. Thank you for the great work you're accomplishing in our life because we put the word of God first place in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God.